matters. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you. So let me bring you back to uh, January 1999, so um, more precisely the January 7, 1999. So it was a joint international coalition of hackers, and among them the cult of the dead cow and the computer chaos club. And they signed a statement, a statement uh, condemning the decision by the hacker group, a legion of underground, to declare war against the government of Iraq and China. And the Legion of Underground wanted to disrupt uh, and disable internet connections and infrastructures of, uh, of those countries, uh, citing human rights violation and other repressive measures of those states. So this is most probably the first, the very first uh, uh, statement uh, in, this, uh, in this respect. So the coalition of hackers strongly oppose any attempt to use power of hacking to threaten and destroy information infrastructure of a country, and in their statement, um, they stress that declaring war against a country is the most irresponsible thing a hacker group can do. Um, this has nothing to do with uh, hacktivism or hacker ethics, and is nothing to, uh, to do with uh, um, uh, the hacker to be proud of. So the statement goes on by saying that governments worldwide are seeking to establish cyberspace as a new battleground for their artificial conflicts. And the Legion of Underground has inadvertently legitimized this army's propaganda. And if hackers solicit recognition as paramilitary factions, then hacking in general will be seen as an act of war. Ergo, hackers will be viewed as a legitimate targets uh, of warring states. So we are now in uh, 2023. So quarter century later, things have just gotten worse. So states have militarized digital space, and the distinction between hackers, civilians, and combatants has become increasingly blurred. So as you may know, one of the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law is the, or the cardinal principle of international humanitarian law is the distinction between civilians and combatants. So this is the only possible way uh, to reduce the risk of harm for people that are not participating in hostilities, thus civilians. So, um, but with the use of digital means and through the integration of the, the digital and the physical domains, civilians are more and more involved into armed conflicts. So making themselves un unrecognizable from competence. So the current trends are moving even worse towards a trivialization of these acts. So we reached a level where the civilian participation is a kind of gamification of offensive operations. So people participating in hostilities through cyber means, they can track the progress and achievement of their activities through dedicated personal uh, statistics. It's like a video game or like a bug bounty program or like a catch of the flag uh, with a ranking of the best hackers um, and with offensive as a service solution, whereas now offensive as a service solutions provided by states, uh, civilians without any knowledge of cyber can participate to offensive operations during armed conflict. Um, so we have graphical interface, we have click and attack buttons, so we have cloud-based offensive capabilities and service. But guys, war is not is not a game. So. We think that some of those civilian hackers do not totally grasp the consequences of their actions. So we can say that certainly a distributed denial of service attack involves the suspensions of a service. So, and this can be seen if a website is down, you see clearly I took it down, but DDoS can be uh, done against every service facing the network. So a critical industrial system, a financial system, a server managing the public transportation, a critical system of an hospital. So, and sometimes uh, those tools they give as a target an IP address, and those shooting their DDoS capability against this 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 kind of target, they even don't know what this IP address is in reality. What what does it represent? 
So what we have seen in the press is that several experts say that uh, DDoS attacks are some sort of low-level cyber attacks. They are considered inferior because they are easy to execute compared to advanced persistent threats, right? But inferior and, des and, and therefore less dangerous. But do we know exactly the targets? Do we know the targets of the DDoS? Do we know exactly what has been taken offline? Do we know exactly the physical consequences of such operations? And, uh, and, uh, and if the service is down, what is happening to the people that are depending on this service? So, and because those kind of attack can be done as a service, you just use the, the platform that uh, they provide and easy to deploy, should we consider DDoS as less dangerous? Should we in some way legitimize or de decriminalize them because everybody is able to execute DDoS attack? So is, in our view, if uh, an offensive operation is degrading or disrupting a connected asset and result or result in injury or death of people is to be considered as a cyber attack. So regardless of the ease of execution. So it's not the complexity, the technical complexity, but is the result of the attack. So what we have seen recently in the in the recent conflicts is that uh, the use of such attacks is mainly against civilian uh, objects. And here I circle back to the fundamental principle of distinction of humanitarian law. So the principle is not just distinguishing combatants and civilians to spare the horror of the war to civilians, but is also Distinguish, distinguishing um, the civilian objects and the military objectives. Um, the problem is that uh, those civilian hackers involved in armed conflict, they are attacking those uh, um, civilian targets. So we are witnessing a kind of a conflict in a conflict, so the war, and inside this war we have civilians attacking civilians' objects. So in several cases involving civilians that are even not in the territory of the conflict, so physically remote from the territory. So these digital means are providing those capabilities to participate in war from remote areas. But the, the absurd stuff of digital means is that uh, you can use also those means very close to the battlefield. So we have this both uh, situation with, uh, with uh, cyber and digital capabilities. So the digital means are also giving the states the opportunity to involve civilians into the conflicts. So by providing these kind of tools, and we see states providing these kind of tools to civilians, states are spreading and promoting the use of these new civilian-enabled capabilities. Um, so what we see is that the civilian involvement in conflict is no longer a purely voluntary act. So we have the general call to population uh, normally in, in war, but here we are in another, in another dimension. So it represents what we call the performative nudging. Let me explain this. So it's when the states are nudging civilians to participate in a city, and at the same time, they provide the tools and the means to participate. So just bringing them inside and then providing the tools to participate uh, to, the, to the conflict. Um, and this performative nudging is supported by the resilience, logically, of information and communication technology systems. So this is why, uh, during the armed conflict, one of the reasons to keep up ICT system is also to be able to provide those capabilities uh, also to civilians. Um, several experts say that uh, there is nothing wrong with uh, encouraging civilians to lawfully directly participate in hostilities when it's in defense of their homeland. But here the thing, the states must acknowledge that uh, with the integration of digital technologies, we are in a very different uh, setup here. So armed forces must be very careful here. So why in the physical world it is normally readily apparent who is participating in the city? So in the, in the physical space, you see someone with a rifle, right? A person carrying a weapon is clearly participating in hostilities. In the cyber or the digital environments, uh, we add in new complexities to this. So this means that with the integration of digital dimension into the physical one, 
it is impossible to determine if someone using a mobile phone is doing for the purpose of the conflict, so participating in hostilities while using an application on their phone, or they are just calling their family members. And this is the problem by providing those tools and uh, by having people using phones to participate in hostility, we don't know anymore who is a combatant and uh, who is a, a, a civilian. So the result is that encouraging, uh, with encouraging this attitude by states, um, we have this uh, digital physical behavior that is normal in time of peace, using a phone for Googling, taking pictures, calling. And now this same behavior that is a peaceful behavior can be mistaken as a potential participation in hostilities. So the consequences is that uh, every civilian with a smartphone may be considered as someone directly participating in hostilities. And this is the absurd situation that uh, we are living nowadays. And so this is the major kind of quantitative uh, shift that we are seeing with the digital means. So now it, it, it is much easier to scale up civilians activity in conflicts so we can create groups of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of individuals uh, that can be created uh, and coordinated online in a matter of hours. And also the, the surface of attack has expanded enormously. So digital devices, services, networks, everywhere. So which means that in times of armed conflict, there are exponentially more vulnerabilities than in the wars of the past. So. That's why, based on those observations, we consider that the phenomenon of civilian hackers uh, conducting cyber operations in the context of armed conflict is a worrying for at least three reasons. So the first one is that they cause harm to civilian populations, either by targeting civilians' objects directly or by damaging uh, incidentally. So the second is that uh, civilian hackers risk exposing themselves and people close to them to military operations. This means that the computers and digital infrastructure they use risk becoming military objective. So it means even there, as a person, they can be uh, targeted. Um, in the adversary eyes, so and depending where the hacker sits, if the hacker sits in the territory of the conflict, they may be attacked. And I mean attacked by bullet, missile, or the cyber operation. So that's civilian hackers risk losing protection against cyber physical attack. Normally, as a civilian during an armed conflict, you are protected by international humanitarian law, but if you participate in a city, you lose this protection. And so this means being attacked by an armed forces. And the third reason is that uh, the more civilians take an active part in warfare, the more the line blurs between who is a civilian and who is a combatant. So the result is the risk of harm to civilians. And this, re this risk is growing and growing with uh, the recent conflict we are seeing. So that's why some, I don't know if you saw some weeks ago, we published, I published with, uh, with my colleague uh, Tillman from, uh, from the ICC, we published an article with the title, Eight Rules for Civilian Hackers Operating in the Context of armed conflict and the four obligations for states to restrain them. This because uh, cyberspace is, the, is not a lawless space, so we have rules in wars. So it goes without saying that civilian hackers must respect the law of the countries they operate in, where these national laws are lenient, not enforced, or if a civilian hacker decides to disregard them, in times of armed conflict, international humanitarian law provides a universally agreed set of rules that aim to safeguard civilians or soldiers that are no longer able to fight from, from the horrors of the war. So, just to be clear, international humanitarian law is not prohibiting hacking as such. So, it does not prohibit its civilians from conducting cyber operations against military assets, against military assets, not against civilian assets. But it sets out elementary consideration of humanity on the protection of civilians, meaning obligations that everybody must respect when conducting cyber 
in the context of farm in the context of farm conflict. So, and this irrespective from the reasons of the conflict and the goals that are deemed legitimate or not, or whether an operation is conducted in offense or defense, even disrupting an operation of an armed conflict could be considered as an offensive operation. So this is why we, uh, we stress the fact that civilians participate in hostility, they have to comply with the international humanitarian law. And this applies very good also to cyber. So some observer, when we published the paper, some observer referred those to those rules, uh, the eight commandments of the Red Cross, or they call the Geneva Code of Cyber War, or even the Red Cross Hacker Geneva Convention. So here is nothing new. Uh, as one also so, uh, said, the Asimov rules for those that uh, that are uh, a fan of Isaac Asimov. Uh, so it's nothing new here. I mean, those rules that we publish are rooted into international humanitarian law, and those rules are just that we know what we're talking about. So the first one is do not direct cyber attacks against civilian objects, and this is what we are seeing daily, and that's a, a really worrying problem. The second rule is do not use malware or tools or techniques that spread automatically and damage military objectives and civilian objects indiscriminately. Why we put this one? Because we see more and more the use of warmable malware spreading around and, uh, and, uh, and the operator are losing control of those malwares and uh, they are going to uh, attack objectives that are not meant to be targeted. The third one is uh, when planning a cyber attack against a military objective, do everything feasible to avoid or minimize the effects of your operation uh, that your operation could have uh, on civilians. And this is a problem because most of the people participating are not planning the attack. They are just participating and shooting against targets that they even know what they are. The, fir the four uh, rules is do not conduct any cyber operation against medical and humanitarian facilities. So we as International Committee of the Red Cross, but also the national societies like Red Cross in, uh, in different uh, countries has been taken down, website or services, from those uh, civilian hackers. The fifth rule is do not conduct any cyber attack against object indispensable for the population, like water supply, electricity, uh, to the survival of the population, or that can release dangerous forces. And when we think dangerous forces, we think uh, power plant, for instance, so do not attack those kind of objects. Do not make threats of violence to spread terror among the civilian population. Do not incite violation, this is rule number seven, do not incite violations of international material law. And uh, as uh, rule number eight, comply with those rules, even the enemy does not. So. The reason the other party is not complying with the international humanitarian law is not the reason to not to comply to uh, international humanitarian law. So, but uh, on the other side, hackers are not living in cyberspace. They are living physically somewhere. So in a territory, they are sitting somewhere. So states should also, they have also obligation. They should encourage or they should not encourage or tolerate civilian hackers to conduct such operation. And this is an evident tension with the international humanitarian law. From one side, international humanitarian law asks states and states sign the Geneva Conventions, ask state uh, and uh, oblige state to, to have a constant care to the, to the population. And from the other side, the states are bringing the civilians into the conflict. So from one side, you have to keep them safe. And from the other side, you push them into the conflict. And this is clearly a tension that we are seeing at the moment. So any state, and practically all the states, that commit to the rule law or rules-based international order must not close its eyes when people on its territory conduct cyber operations in this regard of national and international law, even if directed against an adversary. So this means, for and foremost, to adopt and enforce national laws that regulate civilian hacking. So uh, that's why states have undertaken to respect, ensure uh, the respect to international humanitarian law. And this legal commitment means at least four things. So the first one is that uh, if civilian hackers act under the instruction, direction, or control 
of a state. That state is internationally legally responsible for any conduct of those individuals. So if we have armies of people online that are managed by a state, the state is responsible for what those people are doing. The second is that states must not encourage civilians or groups to act in violation of international material law. So, for instance, providing as a target, a civilian target, uh, is not complying with the IHL, with international humanitarian law. So we ask states not to encourage this kind of behavior. And the third, the states have a due diligence obligation to prevent international humanitarian law violations by civilian hackers on their territory. If they are aware of this uh, situation, they should uh, address this situation. And fourth, states have an obligation to prosecute war crimes if you're attacking a civilian target, if you're not respecting international humanitarian law, this could be considered as a war crime, and the state should take measures to suppress these violations. So in this regard, the international humanitarian law sets essential rules to limit the effects of armed conflict on civilians. So no one that participates in war is behind those rules. In particular, every actor that conducts operations in the context of an armed conflict must respect those rules and state must ensure that this is the case to protect civilian populations against them. So I would like to close my, my speech by citing again the declaration of 1999, so 25 years ago. The signatories to this statement are asking hackers to reject all actions that seek to damage the information infrastructure of a country. Do not support any acts of cyber war. Keep the networks of communication alive. They are the nervous system for human progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, it, so, in truth into advertisement, more of a comment than a question, but you said, like, when civilians are, it's something like, that the, the line between civilians and combatants is becoming increasingly blurred. And the thing that popped into my head, has anybody ever read, like, 1984 by George Orwell? Yeah, you can admit it. Nobody's going to arrest you for saying you read it. You don't have to read the book. Read the book. Anyway, like, there's this doublespeak thing, and what struck me is, like, when you can't tell the difference between civilians and soldiers, you know, you can't tell the difference between kids and adults, and you can't tell the difference between war and peace. And that is sobering. Okay, any other questions? Well, we thank you very much. Thank you very much.